by the gift that you have given us, a community to take care of, so that we can lead this community and all parts of that community to encounter you, to become a missionary community. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So maybe let's continue. Ask ourselves the question, what kind of leadership is needed in a community, in a parish, in a diocese, when we talk about communion in mission? Remember yesterday we talked about culture of leadership is leadership in the Damayang, leadership in the Balanihan, not just when it comes to our ministries of food, celebrating sacraments, formation programs, but much more in the lives of the people. Because Pope Francis said that the church should be really in contact with the homes and the lives of people so that it does not become a useless structure out of touch with the people. This morning we reflected upon a new image that Paul was giving us, the body of Christ. If we take this image, the body of Christ, then what does that say about our leadership? What do you think if Christ is the head of the body, what do you think is the part of the priest? What part do you think is the priest in the body of Christ if Christ is the head? The, the hand, so we say the feet, in one of the seminars, a priest said the neck. And the other one said, it cannot be the neck because otherwise the neck is the one turning the head. And the other one said, that's exactly what I mean because we priests sometimes turn Jesus to our ideas. <laughs> so even if it's not going to be the neck, maybe we can, the we can call maybe the karantamai, the kakiwala. Okay? It's the right hand. A kakiwala means, I'm saying, he can speak in name of the owner, but he is not the owner. But he can speak in name of the owner. He can act in name of the owner, but he's not the owner. And the reason why he is a kakiwala is because he is trusted. And he is trusted because he is a man of integrity. That means that leadership is really based on trust. That really <coughs> leadership is based on integrity. He is trusted by God. That is what we call the charismatic authority. And he is trusted by his community, which we call ideological or dialectical uh, authority. We all know that the influence of the church, of the church leaders, has been very much affected what has happened in the church. We all know that the church leaders don't have anymore the same authority, the same influence as they had 30 years ago. And we all know why, why, because of sexual abuses, because of corruption, because of being concerned so much about power and money. And some people would say that maybe the only way to bring back the trust of the church and the church leaders is to back to integrity because of uh, <coughs> integrity. Only integrity can bring back the trust. I know of a man who says, 
I do it before I accepted any priest. The fact that he was a priest, I really, you know, I look up to him. Nowadays, no more. He had to prove himself first before I trust him. On several occasions, Pope Francis said that the danger for the mission of the church is clericalism. He says, one of the grief, gravest dangers stronger in the church today is clericalism. Clericalism is ultimately a suppression of the baptismal identity of all the faithful. And that's why clericalism of the past left most Catholics in a spiritual <coughs> infancy and did not even begin to equip them for missionary work for mission. The Pope Francis says to the priest, work with the lady, let them go ahead. Don't make them followers, let them go ahead that they have the courage to go forward and you priest, he says, support and help. <laughs> well, the language, work with the lady, let them go ahead. And then, later on, he said something. In March 2016, he said, the hour of the lady has come, but it seems the clock has stopped. The hour of the lady has come, but it seems the clock has stopped. We hear of the empowerment of the lady. But very often, the empowerment of the lady turns only into categories which are known to us as clerical categories. In other words, maybe we taught our people that the fulfillment of their baptismal identity was to perform ministries that were essentially clerical in nature. That means mass servers, lectors, and so on. All connected with what we can call clerical categories. I remember in one of the BEC General Assemblies in Cebu, when they were talking about empowerment of the lady, one bishop was talking about empowerment of the lady, and there was a layman who stood up and he said, Bishop, thank you very much for talking about this topic. But as lay people, you know, you don't have to empower us. Just allow us to use our power. Just allow us to use our power as lay people. The term Lay apostle, which is so often used in the, the, the council, the Vatican II council documents, you know, has been gradually changed to lay ministry. And therefore, it redefines again baptismal calling as to do things inward rather than outward. At intra instead of an extra. If the church is the body of Christ, where all baptized are incorporated, then maybe it means also that leadership should be communion leadership. It means that every baptized has a leadership responsibility for the life of the church and for the mission of the church. Do we as priests, do we really believe this? That since we are talking about the body of Christ, where every baptized is incorporated, that they too have a part. Do we trust the leaders have the capacity? Do we listen to them? Do we listen to poor? Do we listen to the uneducated? You know, personally, looking back my ministry, in the beginning I had some 
difficulties because I had some doubts whether people who were not educated had the capacity to lead and should be consulted. But in the process you know, of dealing with people, living in community, living with other people, I realized that maybe I was wrong. And because of that, we started in the parish consulting people. Every year in the month of October, we make the survey. The survey questions were designed by the Paris Council. Very simple questions, for example, first one, on the legal the level of feelings. How do you feel about your Paris? Excited, good, not so good, or sad, or bad? And they just had to check. All the questions were just to, you had to check. When we wanted to know whether they understood small Christian communities, we asked them, what do you think a small Christian community is? Do you think it's a program? It's an organization? It's a way of life? Four or five questions, and they could just check. We asked them about the sermon. How do you find the sermon? Is it too long? Or is it too, or too short? I think you know the answer. We ask all questions for formation. You know, what is their formation that you would be longing for? And so and so on. They check this. How did we do that? During every mass, we were doing that. In order that the, the people would feel that this is an important this survey, then it was the Paris priests who presided over the survey. <coughs> we had a lot of young people who would come out from the sacristy after the reading of the gospel and distribute the papers to all the people attending the Mass. We give them a, a pencil, which we have cut into three. Okay, otherwise, if we give them the whole pencil, <coughs> they will take it home. So only a small pencil. And then we started reading the questions and people were answering. I can still see the pictures of people, you know, who are not involved in the, active in the church but who were participating in the survey. We had something like 4,000, you know, people who were <coughs> giving their answers. This was collated by the students of the school participation. Also the young people got involved in it in collating it. And this was brought with the, to the Paris Council who was planning for next year. But, and later on, in January, the pastoral program was presented by all those who were active in the Paris, and they voted upon the priority. I'm just sharing this with you okay, as a tool to let people participate to let them feel that they, they are the body of Christ, that they have a place in the parish. If we talk about our communities, our parish community, we can also talk about clergy as a community. Leadership of the clergy community. Our being body of Christ as clergy community witnesses to Jesus as a corporate reality. As a body, we are a corporate reality. And we do feel that and experience this. If, for example, somebody in the diocese is priest, okay, we all feel good about it because he belongs to our body. We also feel the opposite. If somebody makes a mistake, even outside the diocese, as priests, we are affected. We feel the body is hurt. We are hurt. That's why we also how important it is for us to witness as a corporate reality. Wherein everybody is important. Whether he is in a big Paris or a small Paris. Whether he has titles or not. We are a corporate body. And we should Enjoy whatever good is done by our co-priest and 
naturally also we should be affected if ever the body is hurt. Sabi po nila, if we are a body, a body, an indicator that a body is a healthy body if it is energized. Energized means it is growing, it is moving. And opposite of that, of course, if it's not moving, it is not growing, it is not energized. But the question is, where does our leadership energy emanate? Where does our leadership energy come from? Saan nga po ba nagkagaling yung energy that moves us forward as a leadership community? Sabi po ng mga most organizational development experts, meron daw po tayong sources of our energy. Ang una na nga po dyan is clarity of values. Clarity of purpose and clarity of spirituality. What do we mean by clarity of values? Unahin na po muna natin ang values. It is the moral principles that you deeply believe in. Actually po, it is also one of our navigating system. It is our, the inner hierarchy in our heart. It is what makes us decide no, whether to say mass to a small Christian community or attend a Pavarotti concert. It is what helps us decide whether to fix the altar, to use the money to fix the altar, or to spend it on forming our leaders. So it is that inner hierarchy in us that makes us choose which of which do we give priority. That is the clarity of values. Ang clarity of purpose po naman is it's the better future that we would like to create no, against all odds. This is what makes us wake up in the morning. Ito po yung nagpapag-isip sa atin sa umaga. Ito yung nagpapalabas sa atin sa ating kwarto. Nagpapalabas sa atin sa ating mga opisina. Kasi there is something that you would like to accomplish, a better future, a better tomorrow that you would like to create for yourself and also for your community, against all odds, against all difficulties. Pero there is a third a source, which is the clarity of spirituality. Ito po yung core energy in our life. What we represent, no? feeling ko po yung ibig sabihin ng spirituality eh. What we represent, what way of life do we would like to witness to? yun po yung spirituality natin. Kaya nga po, the spirituality is always affected, affects purpose and value. One example na nga po dyan is Paul. Paul, when he was Saul, he had a very clear purpose to eradicate the Christians. Yun po ang kanyang naging purpose eh. Patayin ang mga Christiano, eradicate sila. And his values was based on the Jewish values because he was raised Jewish. No? And yet, when he encountered Christ on that way to Damascus, everything changed. His purpose changed, his values changed because of his encounter with Jesus. Kaya nga po, our energy, our potential of growing or moving depends on that match or mismatch of these things. If there is a match as an individual, it produces a strong leader, it produces an excellent leader. Pag meron pong match yung mga yan. The problem is if there is a mismatch. If there is a mismatch among the three, it produces weak leadership, it also produces mediocrity. Kasi yan yung dyan ka na po pwede sabihin mo lang, ah, pwede na yan. Ah, okay na yan. But also a mismatch produces what we call restlessness. When there is a mismatch in our values, in our purpose, in our spirituality, it produces a restlessness. And alam po naman natin ang restlessness, kabalisaan, anxiousness. It can go either way. It can go towards hopefulness. It can go for seeking what will make us not restless anymore. But it can also go the other way. It can make us angry. It can make us frustrated. It can make us very hard to work with. Kasi nga, hindi magmatch eh. Hindi magmatch yung values natin. Hindi magmatch yung spirituality natin. Hindi magmatch yung purpose natin. Kaya nga po magandang tignan. Noong as a clergy community, 
Alin po what sucks our energy? What de-energizes us? No? What is there? Where is the mismatch coming from? Nasaan ba lang nagaling yung mismatch? And also, if we look at the many issues that we are facing as a clergy community, we can also ask that. No? Where is the mismatch coming from? Why? How come there is restlessness? How come sometimes there is dissent? How come there is arguments? How come there is disagreements? Saan ang gagaling po yun? Where does that emanating from? If we look at our values, halimbawa, you think of any issues that we are facing right now as a clergy community. Is the purpose of that issue clear for you? Bakit siya issue sa'yo? Baka naman, kasi hindi malino sa'yo, ano yung purpose niyan? Bakit pa yan? Bakit yan gagawin? Bakit kailangan sundin yan? Baka, in terms of purpose, hindi siya malino sa'yo. That's why you feel uncomfortable about it. You feel restless about it. Kasi, hindi mo maintindihan what is its purpose. It is muddy for you. Ganun din, baka naman, hindi malino what value that is, that does it represent, that issue represent. Baka naman, Iba yung value, magkaiba yung value, kaya hindi kayo magkasundo, kaya hindi magtugma. Kasi yung value ng isa, ipag-iba sa value na gusto mo, kaya hindi kayo magtugma. Pero deeper than that po, siguro we ask also ourselves, ano po yung spirituality natin? What is the spirituality that we are living? Kasi that is what we represent eh. No? Baka deeper than values and purpose, we have to ask it. What is the spirituality that we're trying to live out? Baka natutun po kasi din yung wisma dyan. It's something deeper, something that is the core in you. Kasi you represent, no? You represent somebody. As priest, alam ko po, malinaw po sa inyo yan. And his way of life is also, should be our way of life. So, baka doon din ang gagalit yung mismatch. Kaya nga, In a community that has a mismatch, usually that is a slow-moving community, no? that is a community that has lesser influence, kasi nga hindi makita ng tao, ano ba yung, what does these people represent? Ano ba yung purpose nila? Ano ba yung value nila? Ano ba yung spirituality na nanarepresent nila? Ganun din naman, leaders who have very clear purpose, these are the very charismatic leaders. People no, can follow them through and through. You talk about Martin Luther King, no, who has a very clear purpose, and people are enamored by that. They were attracted to him because he has a clear purpose. You talk about Mother Teresa, who has a very clear spirituality, no, clear values, niya, and people are attracted to her. The same way with other leaders. No? Kahit na minsan, baka on the negative side naman. No? Like, Osama Bin Laden, no? He has followers, he has, because for him, maybe he has a clear purpose, he has a clear value, no? He has a clear spirituality, and that makes him attractive, attractive to people, kasi nga, meron siyang clarity na gano'n. So we also look into that, where is our energy emanating? But also, what is sucking our energy? What is taking the energy out of us Of we, as individuals, as leaders, what is there that is sucking my energy? But also, as a clergy community, what is there also that is sucking the, our energy? That is not making us move from maintenance mode to missionary mode. Kasi yun po ibig sabihin when we are growing, eh? when we are moving forward, when you are energized. No? From a maintenance mode to a missionary mode, that is that energy that pushes us forward. And maybe we can ask also ourselves, what is keeping us in the maintenance mode? So what is there that sucks our energy, that makes us comfortable just where we are and does not want to move? Because an energized body is a moving body. It is a growing body. So what is stunting our growth? What is preventing us from moving?
I would like to share a little bit on what we mean by clarity of purpose, clarity of values, and clarity of spirituality, and how important this is for us. As we have heard, clarity of purpose is the, pur is the better future we want to create against all our odds. We, against all odds, we want to create a better future. When you say a clarity of purpose, right away what comes to my mind is, you know, having a shared vision. Having a shared vision as a diocese, having a shared vision as a parish. A vision is what we call an inner image of a future state. It tells us how beautiful a parish would be if everybody would get involved, where everybody could participate, where everybody could experience that they are church. Vision, they say, is the first step in the future. Otherwise, we are all the time in circles, moving in circles, doing the same programs all over again and again. Vision is the one that gets us out of the loop. Without a vision, our lives, our programs will be the same as in the past. Same programs, the same way of conducting meetings, giving formations. In the book, in the book of Proverbs, it says that first in chapter 29, verse 18, where there is no vision, people perish. Where there is no vision, people perish. What does it mean when people perish? It means people get so tired of doing the same thing all over again. That where there is no direction, the same programs, doing things all over again and again. People really get tired and they lose their enthusiasm. But not only the people, but also the leaders. They also feel tired. I can easily recognize a priest who has no vision. Okay? He is somebody who is complaining all the time, who is tired, who doesn't find fulfillment in his mission. Pope Francis compared a parish without a vision as a bus that is parked in the parking lot of the parish. He says the bus in your parish without a vision is like a bus parked in the parking lot of the parish. And it has no signboard. It has no signboard where it is going. That's why it, it stays there all the time in the parking lot. And people come on Sundays and sit in the bus for one hour and then live again. In that kind of bus, you don't need a driver. You only need a conductor who comes and checks, who sits in the bus and collects the money. We don't need exactly a leader in a parish like this. We need only a manager. And this is why maybe if that kind of with that kind of mentality, if there is no vision for the parish, this is maybe the reason why this develop this parish develops in a mediocre parish. Okay? Which means you know with an attitude of with an attitude of minimalism. An attitude of you have to be baptized. You have to go to church, you have to go with, you have to get married in the church, and you have to be buried in the church. But not at all of making a disciple, or becoming a disciple, or a missionary disciple. A vision is a dream. Okay? Pope Francis always talks about dream. Okay? He says in one of his talks, he said, never, for, never stop dreaming. 
But vision is more than a dream. Yes, it is a dream, but it is anchored in the realities of life. It is connected to the situation of people. It cannot be disconnected. It has to come from the people. That's why we would say we can call it a shared vision if as many people as possible were able to participate in making the vision. And that is what unites a diocese very much. That is what unites a parish very much, is a shared vision. Because people participated in it. It's not the dream of the leader or the leaders. It's the dream of as many people as possible. That's why where there is a shared vision, you know, there is ownership. And the effectiveness of a shared vision is exactly the ownership. Because they own it, because they were a part of it, they are willing to cooperate with one another in order to make it the possible. possible. Vision is not a matter of theological formulation. It's a matter of ownership. And that's where why when a vision has been in a diocese for some time, there is a need to revisit the vision. Not maybe to change much of the vision, but to increase the ownership. And that's why we have developed, as Bukhavati Park, what we call a participatory visioning process, which we have been doing in several dioceses. Starting, you know, with training people for house to house visit. Asking them, what is your situation here in your community? And what kind of church can respond to this situation? And then it goes up to the neighborhood. Then the same, but maybe different questions of the parish, of the, the barrio level that to the parish level and then to the diocese. And finally, there is what we can call a shared vision, owned by as many people as possible. What was asked Cardinal Quevedo? You know, if this, you know, these words come from the people because the vision, as it was stated by George, it should come from the words of the people. Is there not a danger that there would be heresies in the vision statement? <laughs> and he said, do not be afraid, he said, because heresies do only come not from ordinary people, they come from the theologians. <laughs> when we talk about mission then, what is mission? Mission is propelled by the vision of church. It's mission that is propelled by the vision of the church. If we say the vision is the what, the mission is the how. Mission is the doing of the vision. So maybe we can ask also, do we have a shared vision in our diocese? Is this the vision that is owned by a small group or by many people, by all, is it just a vision that is passed on to us and we have to comply with it? Because there's a big difference between compliance and commitment. Maybe sometimes, in some time since we have experienced there is a lack of energy for vision because a lack of ownership of the vision. A lack of energy for mission because a lack of ownership of the vision. That's why we cannot emphasize enough the ownership of the vision. It has to be owned by as many people as possible. One day we were called by a bishop 
And he said, can you come over and help us out? Because, you know, some five years ago, I wrote a very nice vision okay, together with some people in the office. And then we asked an office from Manila if they could put that vision into a pastoral program, a five-year pastoral program. And we have this, we have, and it's a big book with all detailed plans and so on. The problem is, it does not work. The problem is that after five years, we can say not much has happened, not much has changed. When we went there, it was very obvious. The problem was that it was not owned by the priest and not owned by the people. And I really admire the bishop. He said, let's start all over again and doing it in the right way. Ownership is the key when it comes to vision. When we talk about clarity of values, we say these are the principles we believe in and we, we, we live by. When we talk about communion of communities in mission, we do not only think about our parish. We should get out of our parish. We should get out into the diocese. We should get into networking. We should work with other groups outside the parish towards a common purpose. Towards a common purpose. That is why we call it the clarity of values becomes important in communion. We reach out to others where we share common values. We reach out to others where we share common values. If I look at, looking back at the parish, okay, how working with other agencies, with networking, really has enriched our own community, our own faith community. As I told you at the beginning, when I did not know what to do, how to make people participate in the parish, okay, how to bring them together, how do you form communities and so on. I went out to Marpoal, I went out to Mindanao, I went out to Takpilaran to look for people who would inspire me. What I was looking for were common values the value of participation. We have this in common. And because of what I saw, that is how we, they convinced me to start with BECs. When we later on started in the Paris in 1969, our first ministries were not, you know, clerical ministries in the sense. They were all related to the poor people, many poor people living outside, just outside of our church communities. And again, what we were looking for were a group of people who had the same values, okay? Who wanted to, you know, who valued the lives of the poor people, who valued the dignity of the poor people, who saw in that it was possible with the poor people to transform the community. And I found them in ASI, Asian Social Institute. We had this common value. That's why we could work together, we could influence. We were influenced by them. Later on, as we were able to support this squatter communities, you know, from defending them against the demolition of Imelda Marcos. And in 86, you know, how we worked together with NHA in giving the 1,700 people a piece of land. Okay. When that was finished, from doing charity for the people, we started with doing things with the people. And that is what we can call the cooperative model. And this is where we started working with Dante Bustaino, the former leader of the NPA. Okay, because we shared some <coughs> common values. <coughs> At this time, in our country, I think as we face so many problems, political, 
social, okay, and all kinds of conflict situations and confusions. Maybe we only be as church or so as a community mission. Maybe we are also called to network okay, and partner with people okay, who have the common values, share the work for a common good, especially the poor ones among us. Let me talk about the clarity of spirituality. Spirituality is the energy of our lives. It is what grounds purpose and values. We could always say vision is the sight. Mission gives us the legs and passion gives us the wings. Vision, maybe, is a what. Mission is a how. And passion is the why. We cannot see enough that when we start moving a community, a parish from, towards a movement of communion in, in mission, it has to be powered by Jesus. It has to be powered by the Holy Spirit. We are not implementing a pastoral program. We are not implementing a change of structures. What we are implementing is the call of God, God's call. That's why communion in mission is a discipline, is a discipleship story. It is a discipleship story. It's answering God's call. If we don't have the love of God in our hearts, then there is no fire in our hearts. There is no passion in our veins. Maybe we lack passion because we do not go back enough to the source of fire, Jesus. Without passion, our words sound empty. Our words are clanging symbols. Without passion, we do not inspire people. <coughs> that is the one that gives the influence, the passion. I always see such a big difference between a commitment and a passionate commitment. A commitment is I walk the mile I have promised. The passionate commitment is I walk the extra mile. And it is in the extra mile that you find the joy of being a minister, of being a priest. By just doing what I'm supposed to do, we were, we were just, we will not find a meaningful life. We will not be able to influence people. People are influenced because of the passion, because people are willing to do something extra not what, only what they are supposed to do. That is why passion is so important. And then let me read just Pope Francis, when he was in Colombia just a few days ago, he made a statement which I copied and I want to read it for you. He said, I would like to sum up all of this in a phrase that I leave to you as a synthesis of this meeting. If you want to serve the Latin America, you can, you can change this. If you want to serve your diocese, we have to do so with passion. A passion that <coughs> nowadays is often lacking. We need to put our heart into everything we do. We need to have the passion of young reverends and of wise elders. A passion that turns ideas into viable utopias. A passion for the work of our hands. A passion that makes us constant pilgrims in our churches. My brothers, please, I ask you for passion the passion of evangelization. Mm. 
Maybe if we lack passion, maybe it's because our dreams are not big enough. Pope Francis says, our God is not inert. But our God, and he said, I permit myself the word, our God is a dreamer. He dreams of the transformation of the world and he realized it in the mystery of the resurrection. We cannot just be satisfied. We cannot just say, Pwede na, sige na. We cannot just go on with mediocrity. We cannot just go on but thinking only about our limitations and not the possibilities. Because when we develop that attitude of being self-satisfied, if we develop an attitude of a self-seeker, just thinking about ourselves, then we will lead, we will never be able to move out of what we call a maintenance mode to a 